sustainability of local journalism. We are a little bit light on the ground today, but I can assure people that no one has resigned from the committee uh, yet. Anyway, uh, I wish to welcome our three first panellists, so our three guests on our first panel. We have Maria Breslin, the editor at Liverpool Echo, David Floyd, director at Social Spider, and Carl Hancock, chief executive, Nub News. So Maria, David and Carl, thank you very much for, 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 for coming and joining us today. Now, uh, just before we begin, we do need to do a few interests. They are a little bit ancient history, but for, for, for transparency sake, I think we're going to do them. First of all, I was a, a BBC journalist for five years, a newspaper journalist for uh, another 12, and I was also father of chapel at the independent newspaper. John Nicholson. Um, I was a BBC uh, reporter and presenter. I was an ITV uh, news presenter an LBC presenter, and until recently, a rather unlikely talk radio presenter. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Maria, I'm going to come to you first, if, if I may, as the sort of representative of a, of a, of a historic title. Um, how have you been able to adapt your business model, your working model, uh, facing the challenges that, that, that your industry has faced? So I think two... 2014 was like a really key year in our transformation. Um, it was when we became a digital first publication and brand. Um, looking back, it was a lifeline, I think. And, you know, David Higgerson, I think, is not always given the credit he's due for, for sort of saving some of, of the country's historic titles and, um, and giving them a, a much longer life. Um, so we had a total change. Um, we became digital first. Everything was about our platforms as opposed to our, our newspaper. Our newspaper remains incredibly important to us. Um, it's far from a niche product, I would say. Um, it's still the best-selling regional newspaper in England. Um, but we realised that we had to do something because habits were changing. So we pretty much ripped up the model, really. Our day had previously been dictated to by, by the book, you know, how many, how many articles we produced were dictated by how many pages there in the paper. There was no real sense of urgency. We'd gone to an overnight model. Um, and it really did revitalise the newsroom and I think our sort of position within, within the community in which we're based. So it was quite a seismic change. Not everybody made it. Some people couldn't and some people wouldn't, but it really has made us much more relevant and also much noisier. The, the reach of, of the Liverpool Echo now was 10.3 million people in April, according to Ipsos Iris data, and we reached 57% of the local population. So it really has given us a real stake in our community, I think. And, and how do you, because uh, it's often said to me about by local journalists, but that they, they, they do the really hard news. Um, that is paid for, though by effectively the, the, the lighter, fluffier stuff, and that's the compromise they have to do, the sort of stuff that, that effectively um, still creates, in, uh, obviously is, is based on interest, and reader interest, but it's probably not something they would, they, they went to journalism school in order to do, so to speak, Maria. Um, is that a fair characterisation of, 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 of the, the sort of, the, um, the, uh, the way in which you have to uh, balance things off? I mean, I think there's elements of truth in it, undoubtedly. Um, but what I would say is the Liverpool Echo has always been a populist publication. And from, you know, the very first day I, I laid eyes on it, it had recipes, it had fashion, it had beauty, it had all sorts of different content strands that, that still exist today. Um, and I think we're quite unashamed about that. We, we do cater for, for a broad population. But public service journalism is as key to our ethos today as it was when we first launched. So I wouldn't say it's a trade-off as such, and I think you, you very much can go down a route of, of snobbery in, in suggesting that some journalism is more valuable than others. I think, you know, we have a problem if we're only doing one, but light and shade has always been, you know, a key part of, of what we publish, whether it's in print or, or on any of our digital platforms. So I wouldn't say it's a trade-off as such, but very much an integral part of, of who we are. How would you measure success in the journalism? Would it be views? 
it, it varies. A success for our political editor is quite different to success for our showbiz editor. They're, they're different metrics, they're different values, and we celebrate all forms of success. So, you know, page views are important to us, and I don't think they should be a dirty word. But at the same time, you know, time spent, engagement, how much we infiltrate the local markets, how that there are very many different KPIs we operate to, and they will differ depending on, KPIs, on the role. KPIs, sorry, KPIs. Sort of key performance. Uh, indicators, okay, fine, yeah. fine. Really, thank you. Uh, David and Carl, you're both sort of relatively new local news titles. If you just speak up a little bit, I'm a bit... Oh, yeah. sorry, sorry, okay. sorry, Carl. Normally people tell me to shut up, so I'm quite happy to. Uh, the louder the better. Yeah, that's fine. So you're both relatively new local titles, if you like, and what, what factors in the local news environment led you to choose your operating model? Do you want to go first, Carl, and then I'll bring David in? Um, yeah, I, I think something, well, it had to be cheap, it had to be a low-cost model, and it had to be local. Um, we benefited from not being in print, so we had a low-cost model. So we went through a, a one journalist per two town model, and that's what we pursued. So we go into towns, small towns, large towns, and really say one journalist per town, build the audience and then build the revenue. It's purely on, on that basis, So, and we're still testing that model right now. Right, OK. David? Yeah, so we uh, launched our first newspaper in 2014, and we, we went with a print-first uh, business model at the beginning, really because, uh, in our, based on our structure as a not-for-profit social enterprise, if you don't have investment money to burn, then the biggest available source of income is still the residual market for print advertising. So because we wanted to create jobs for journalists in the local area and you know, produce high-quality news publications, print was initially the, the route we've gone down, and, and we still have our print newspapers, and they're still our biggest revenue source, but we are now looking more at how we can generate more income from online alongside that. Mm -hmm. I thought that probably falls, falls into my next question. What are the main challenges facing new entrants to the market, would you say, David? I, I think one of the biggest challenges is some of the slightly... Um, archaic law that is is in place around uh, around public notices advertising so uh, from our position we publish a monthly newspaper and in all the uh, the boroughs we we operate in we are the biggest circulation publication in those london boroughs but the corporate our, cor our corporate competitors who publish uh, this this is a regular refrain yeah. for new entrants that effectively they don't get any slice of the pie when it comes well, to those well, 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 lucrative well, well, well yeah because because the issue is that, that because of i think a law from sometime in the 1870s right. perhaps you can only get public notice advertising if you're classified as a newspaper based on being published every 26 days or more frequently. So if you're a monthly paper, you can't get that, that income. And in, in London Borough of Waltham Forest, you know, so that's one example, we, have, we, we publish 15,000 copies of our paper, Waltham Forest Echo. The rival NewsQuest publication sells around 2,000 copies, employs no local journalists. We employ three local journalists. They get, you know, average of 90 grand a year in public notice advertising from the local mm. council and and we get nothing the 90 grand a year public notice advertising budget they get is more than the entire operational budget of our newspaper in that area if we got if we could get even a slice of that money we could put that directly into local journalism mm. so that is a that's a real barrier for, for new entrants if they're not going to make the leap to publishing a weekly publication irrespective of whether it actually has original journalism in that. Right. Well, I, would, I would agree with David. Uh, public notices are a huge barrier to entry to new businesses. Um, equally, public advertising campaigns by the government during COVID, mm. where 50 to 100 million was given to the main publishers, n most of that, 90% plus, went to the three or four main national papers. Mm. None of the independents got, uh, hardly any of the independents got any of that. Some of that going towards any of the independents, towards Nub News and others, would have made a huge, huge difference to the growth of our business. Thank you. Um, John Nicholson. Thank you very much in, indeed, Chair, and thank you uh, for coming on such a momentous uh, day. Maria, I, I really agree with you about the whole issue of um, light and shades and a lot of snobbishness around certain types of journalism, because I know just how hard it is to do tabloid journalism. I remember when I 
first did LBC coming straight from the BBC and making longer films for Newsnight, and I did LBC with Jane Moore of the of the Sun, um, and we presented together. Uh, she was an absolute master at doing really snappy, well written, funny, uh, often right wing commentary, um, and it's always a challenge. I think, especially if you're politically on the left and more likely to write for the Guardian or, or work for the BBC to. Uh, to challenge that, so it was a, it was a really fascinating learning experience. Um, however, on today of all days, as perhaps we hope we're moving away from post-truth politics uh, and back into the, into the light, um, do you think that, that there has been a, a problem with some recent journalism? Uh, the need for clickbait has perhaps encouraged journalists um, to move away from truthful stories in order to produce more provocative stories? I mean, I think, I think there's probably a question around the definition of clickbait. Um, it, writing headlines that appeal to people has always been an art form in, in, in years gone by in terms, of, in terms of newspaper journalism. And equally today, we obviously want to write a headline which will, which will encourage people to click and read the story because, because that's what we want. We want people to read our journalism. And I think there has become a sector where clickbait simply means content I'm not interested in um, and that, that is not right. Um, that is where the snobbery comes in. But I would, we would never do clickbait journalism because we have a loyal audience in Liverpool and that audience trusts us, and, and that was extremely evident during during the pandemic and COVID, when when we saw that people wanted trusted news from reliable sources, like fact checked by qualified journalists. We actually saw that in terms of our audience. So, the temptation to do clickbait may exist in some organisations, but certainly not in mine. It, it, it does it. It's a short-term gain, isn't it? I, I totally agree. I think that's, that's key. But the, the, the problem, I suppose, for some journalists is with a shrinking market for the kind of traditional news that we all grew up with and enjoyed, um, you have to shout ever louder and perhaps become ever more extreme to attract the attention of your shrinking, ever older audience. And that perhaps encourages... Um, carelessness when it comes to traditional journalistic ethics? Um, I think you're right. I think the internet is a noisy place and social media is even noisier. Um, I think we have worked really hard to find an audience for the, the sort of quality content you are talking about. I'm very proud of our, our political coverage. Liverpool is a political city, not necessarily... We're not party political, but I'm very proud that we've grown an audience for our political coverage. It's quite easy to write off politics as something people don't really read. You don't expect to, to get a big audience. Well, we've proved that wrong. So I think, really, we just have to keep going. And we have to work a lot harder than we had to pre-2014 when we put something in the paper and assumed people read it. You know, the data is, is, is quite brutal at times. And we have to look at that data and think, this is important content that is of the public interest, and we have to find a way to make sure it resonates with our audience. Um, David, the pay and conditions for journalists is a real problem. Because when I first started out, um, as, a, as a journalist, you know, you'd go into some of the traditional newspapers like the, the Herald or the Evening Times in my home city of Glasgow, and journalists took time over stories. They were, they were well paid, well fed, certainly well watered, um, a, a lot of them, uh, and it was a lifetime career. But now journalists are having to churn out content. Uh, fact checking should be easier because of the internet, but there is a there is a sloppiness, isn't there, or a tendency towards sloppiness, mostly because there's so much out there that if you make a mistake, you know, you can move on. Um, regulation is, uh, is pitifully weak. You can say things that simply aren't true, and you'll hope perhaps that people just forget about it. It's, 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 it's tomorrow's chip paper. Well, I, I, I think there's a real challenge. I think there's a real challenge between the interaction of business models that are emerging and then what journalists are being asked to do as a result. And I mean, some of you may have seen the uh, report that Press Gazette did a few weeks ago on the situation at, at My London, um, where you know, the, the journalists there, you know, a number of them very concerned about having to, to 
churn out 10 news stories a day in, in some cases. And you know, that's a phenomenally difficult thing to do. And you know, you're obviously not going to churn out 10 news stories a day of, of high quality. You're going to be finding some content from, from anywhere you can and, and pushing it out there. And you know, the journalists, uh, I know, you know corporate publications are all, are all doing their best under those circumstances, but that isn't a recipe for for high quality news and it isn't a recipe for a rewarding career. I mean, the, the challenge we have, we, we very much focus on uh, making the conditions different for journalists. We're not asking any of our journalists to, to write 10 stories a day. We don't think that's useful for local communities and we don't think that's a, a fair ask of, of the journalists themselves. We can't do very much on the pay side because there's, there's just not a lot of money around. You know, however good your intentions are as uh, you know, publishers of, of newspapers, the, the, there is you know, currently finite resources for news, so we're attempting to make the best of, of what we can with, with what's available. But certainly I think the starting point is how can you give people coming into journalism the opportunity to, to develop meaningful careers and to report the news that is of interest to local people. And I think the more we can promote models that allow that, definitely the better. Thank you. Uh, Carl, I, yeah, I wanted to come to you next because I've been reading your CV and it's an interesting CV and I'm passionate about journalism and I want young people to come into uh, journalism. But it's a difficult career to enter, isn't it? I mean, look at London, for example. How could, a bigger one? It's difficult to... It's difficult to enter as yeah. a career. Look at London, for example, or Glasgow or Edinburgh or any of the big cities in these islands. Uh, to afford rent to dream of buying a house, how can you possibly do it on the sort of incomes that journalists are currently being paid at entry level? It, it's tough. I think the average wage of a journalist is the same 20 years ago, 24, 25,000 pounds. But before I answer that, can I just answer the clickbait question? I think the established players, they don't do clickbait, but their business model is to chase clicks. That's what they have to do. They gave away their business for free. Um, Can you explain that distinction? Well, in it they have programmable adverts, so anybody that clicks onto their screen, you, you see a Google ad or another ad, and they get paid per click. So it's in their interest to have as many people reading their paper as possible, which is good, which is what we want as well. We don't have programmable adverts or Google ads like that. So what they do is they need as many people coming onto their sites as possible, uh, which we all do, but that means they have to widen their region. So they will won't write on towns, they may write on counties. So if I'm living in Devon, I might get a, a story about an, a motorway crash two hours away from where I live, which is not really local news. So they've gone from being local to regional. And in some cases now, as they, get, as they have to get more and more clicks, they even go national. So what we've done at Nup News is we don't want to, we don't care about Beyonce's dress, quite frankly. We care about you know, what's happening in our towns. So if you look at our principles, it is about local news. It's not about chasing those clicks wherever they may be. But it's not clickbait. It's more about chasing a, a wider audience. And I think the world is going back to a more local audience now, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, I, I, I like to read about Beyonce's dress as well as, <laughs> um, as, 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 well as politics and, and local stuff too. I write for four newspapers in my constituency and I really enjoy doing it and of course the challenge as a politician is to write stories that are not party political because they don't want that, they want me to write uh, jur journal journalese, journalism. Um, I notice I get lots of people coming up to me to say they've read my column, sometimes they say they've disagreed with me, sometimes they say they've enjoyed the column. The age demographic is quite striking. I don't often get young people coming up and talking about it. And maybe that's because in the prime of middle youth, I've started to write um, from a, a, a more uh, elderly perspective. But I don't think it's that. I think it's because the audience is, is older. How do you get young people engaged in news and current affairs? Or are they engaged, but just engaged in a different way? They're engaged. The older audience obviously still buy the local print. 
Um, my son, 24 years old, never bought a paper in his life. He goes on to news. Um, but what we're trying to do at Nub News is, if you look at our demographics, it's pretty evenly spread from 18 plus all the way up to 65 in those 10-year brackets. Um, and so older people generally are interested in local news. As they get older, they care about their town. Uh, but we do different things on our site, so we emphasise what's on, what entertainment is happening, what bands are playing, what karaoke is, or the quizzes in the local pubs. So that's how we try to get the younger audience in, and it's showing with the results. Like I say, it's fairly... Our demographics are evenly spread, 18 to 65, but I imagine a local newspaper, probably 40, 50 plus. So do you think you're in competition with Maria and Maria's type of journalism, or do you think uh, that you can coexist going forward? We're in competition, 100%, um, but they've got two models. They've got the print model and they've got the internet model. And how those, they, those combine, I'm not so sure. But in Crew, for example, I compete with Reach. They have the Crew Chronicle, 3,000 circulation, £1.95 a week. We have 9,000 subscribers, 15 to 20,000 people come onto our website. We're significantly bigger than them when you compare print to digital. But when they go onto the digital side for reach, they're huge because they've got the whole of Cheshire Live as well. So there is competition there, 100%. But we stick to local and we have dedicated journalists for our towns rather than regional. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I know that I love the feel of a newspaper in my hand and I buy newspapers, especially doing our job, we travel a lot. So I love to sit in the train or in the plane and read a, news, and read a newspaper, especially ones that irritate, uh, irritate me with their politics. But then I also, I also love, um, I love Joe Politics, for example, online, which has got a terrific young team and they do a mixture of written journalism, they do video journalism, uh, they're funny and they're fast and they're provocative and that gives me hope for the future of journalism because I think the quality of that kind of produce is, is strikingly good. Uh, back to you Chair. Thanks. Before I go to change, just one quick question for you Maria if I may. Is it possible to move to a pay model in local news from where the industry is now in, in all its forms? I mean, I'd never say never, um, because obviously we, we have to innovate and we have to, to move forward, and it's a very fast-changing industry. I think it's quite difficult at the moment when you have the BBC with a, a free model, it's ad-free, it's very difficult to compete against that. What we do is, is local news, and I think, I think there's, there's a real evidence in this country that people are prepared to pay, um, to pay for local news. It's not the same as it is in, say, Scandinavia or perhaps the US. Um, I think it's niche products tend to be the ones that have worked the best, and we are not niche. Um, as I said, we are populist. Um, Liverpool is not a wealthy city, and we're in the midst of a cost of living crisis, um, so I would have concerns about that too. So it's not something that's currently on the agenda, um, but I would, I would never say never. I think we have a viable... We have a viable solution. We just need a little bit of help. Thank you. Can I, can I David? I it's a really interesting question, and I think there's a challenge in, in the UK that not, a lot, not enough has kind of been done to pump prime this, this market in terms of th that kind of payment for journalism. So if you take the example of London Borough of Barnet, where we currently have an online-only model, there's a population of 400,000 residents there. There's currently no local journalists employed by the, by the corporate media operating in the area. If 2,000 people in London Borough of Barnet, 0.5% of the population, paid £5 a month, to support a local news publication, you'd have 120 grand a year. You could have a really decent local news publication employing you know, two or three journalists easily, and that could work really well. The challenge is, how do you get to those 2,000 people out of 400,000 who are going to pay you five pounds a month for a local news publication? How do you connect with them with the right kind of product? And you know, how do you make that case that this is this is what matters? And that's something that we, as a social enterprise, you know, we would love to have the opportunity to try to do that. But you'd have to put quite a lot into the investment to really pushing that and making that happen. You know, it's, you, you couldn't 
you couldn't really bootstrap it, it would be very difficult to do that. So it would be great to attempt that. Well, to, to follow on for that, you know, absolutely, that would be the dream scenario. Um, but we go back to the barriers to entry uh, and how do we grow? Um, we do not, we need to build the audience, we need to build the revenues, we don't have the money for that. Um, if we did, then I would, you know, to one year, two years, three years down the line, I would love to have a subscription model. I think we can get there, we just need to be given a chance. Great, thank you. Jane Steens. Um, good morning. Um, I'd like to go back to um, the internet and, and social media presence. Um, can I ask you all, how necessary is a social media presence now to your business models and, and briefly why and what options did you think about when entering the space? Um, Carl, shall we? I'll go first because I'll probably say something different about Facebook than any other newspaper around this country. Uh, I'm 100% grateful for Facebook, um, which is probably surprising to, to most of you. Uh, and I'd pretty much say if it wasn't for Facebook, Nub News would not exist right now. It enabled us to grow an audience. It enabled us to share our stories to the Facebook communities in our towns. That enabled us to grow our own Facebook community and our brand as well. So um, I'm not one of these journalists that's going to be banging negatively about Facebook. For them, um, you know, they've been the lifeblood for, for Nub News and to help it grow. And it's still 40 to 45 percent of our audience. Thank you. David, do you... Yeah. I suppose we're in kind of an interesting position because we started publishing in 2014. So we're not one of those publishers who are saying social media has come along and stolen all the advertising money we were entitled to or you know that kind of thing that that's that's not that's not our position because we never had that money in the first place so it's it's more you know social media to what extent is is that you know a platform for for publicizing what we do and interacting with the public and it is it's an extraordinarily useful platform i mean certainly uh, some of our editors make a lot of use of Twitter in terms of uh, both uh, tweeting out stories and connecting with local people about stories. Others use Facebook more, um, both in terms of our own Facebook pages, but also in terms of interacting with, with the public you know, openly and declaring ourselves as journalists within, within local, local Facebook groups. So, so social media is, is, is really useful for us, uh, but obviously there are challenges associated with it as well. I'm going to d delve down a little bit further, but Maria, do you want to just answer yeah. the initial? I mean, you know, we've had sort of, you know, commercial relationships with, with some of the tech giants such as Facebook, um, and so we've, we've certainly benefited from some of the, the schemes, um, primarily the NCTJ Facebook Community Reporter Scheme. Um, we have two Facebook Community Reporters, and that's, that's really um, brought something new to the table. Um, and, you know, there's opportunities there, definitely. There's the opportunity to find new audiences, and I was interested um, about, you know, finding a, a younger demographic, which is, is a challenge across the whole industry, I think. Um, and we can certainly use some of the, of the newer platforms um, to try and find that audience, not necessarily as a, a page-view-driving initiative, but a brand awareness. So, you know, there are def definitely benefits, I, I would agree. Um, what there isn't is a level playing field, and I think I think that's quite you know been quite well documented. And there's certainly a, a lack of transparency, I think. And we would support any efforts I think that that the government may be involved in to to try and address um, that situation. I think. Okay. Can, I, can I add as well? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to give you some stats about Facebook and Google. Facebook and Google are very important, but for us, Google are much much more important. They offer a customer coming to us or a reader coming to us from Google is eight times more engaging than a customer coming from Facebook. Someone coming from Facebook will come onto our site, they'll stay there for about 20 seconds and they'll probably only have, look at one, one and a half sites where a Google customer will come on, stay on much longer and look at more pages. So for me, Google is eight times more engaging for a customer than, than Facebook. Thank you. Interesting. Um, uh we're wondering if social media is driving behaviour that does damage local news reputations. Um, and the other thing I'd, I'd welcome your comments on, some news titles are developing their own s sort of social discussion platforms rather than staying on, on, on big, bigger providers. Um, why do you think that's happening? What are the benefits and have you thought about it? So that's a lot of question in, in one. Um. I think going back to, back to social media, I mean, I think what we would like to see as, as a short term is, is a sort of credible, trusted news 
um, services giving some priority on social media. I think we saw during the pandemic that that, that wasn't the case, and it, it's quite easy for the rumour to become facts on social media, and that that is a concern I think in terms of in terms of what is trusted um, on those platforms and the impact that might have on on democracy. I would say, um, no plans to build our own social media platforms. We do we do we we are on social media, and and, and that is fact of life. And our audience is there, or part of our audience is there, and so we need to be there. Um, we, we do have our own commenting facilities, which are, um, which are quite lively at times, um, <laughs> for want of a better word. Um, know this about yes. social media. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I engage, I mean, we have to engage with our audience. We absolutely have to talk to them. We absolutely, you know, have to listen to what they have to say. And thankfully now that can be in real life. Um, but it still exists within, within the social sphere as well. And so we, we need to continue doing that. I think my main concern about the impacts of social is the is what um, the effect it's had on our reporters. Um, I think we're we're perhaps the first group to appoint an um, online safety editor. Um, and sadly, it, even this week alone, I've, I've had to use her services. I think um, the, the mental health of journalists, because of the impacts of social media, which can be quite brutal, is is of a concern and something I'd like to see those platforms do so can a lot I, more. It's really interesting. Can I just ask what her role is? What sort of stuff would she be doing day to day? Yeah, she, she, uh, we're encouraged to report any sort of abusive behaviour on, on social platforms, and in fact, you know, through email or any other... Um, communication channel and um, it, it might be liaising with the police if it's a criminal matter it might be sort of speaking to the um, platform provider itself to see if there's anything they can do about banning the user um, she's sadly a lot busier than, than you would hope um, so that that is a concern and something I'd like to see that those platforms take a lot more seriously because you know it's been a difficult two much, two years for a lot of us and I think you know the impacts on on our team's mental health has, has already been, you know, quite testing in terms of the pandemic, and it also seems to have made people much more vitriolic on, on some of those platforms. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. David, do you want to come in? Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, I don't disagree with uh, anything that Maria is saying in terms of the, the way that the platforms have a responsibility to stop, you know, abuse of people on, on their platforms, and that, that, is, that is a bad, bad thing, and particularly a bad thing for for journalists who are engaging in, you know, in, a, in a positive way with good intentions. But I suppose I, I think the, the relationship between uh, social media and journalism is, is kind of, I think, more complex than uh, m might sometimes be cited. I mean, I, I, I think it's, there's, there's, not, there's not necessarily a negative impact on local news as a result of social media. I mean, you know, Facebook groups, to some extent, you know, do things well that that local news is no longer in a position to do, but but in many areas would never have been in a position to do. You, you know, like if you know, there's some, some massive local news, uh, uh, lo local Facebook groups in some of the areas we operate in, with tens of thousands of, of members, and if if you want to find out what was that bang down the road, you know, yesterday evening. Your, your weekly corporate newspaper would never have been a really very useful vehicle for, for finding that out at the best of times. So, so in, 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 in many areas, these local groups add a lot in terms of bringing people together and focusing on, on positive campaigns and messages as well as the negative stuff. I think the, the danger is, is that in any sort of communications landscape where lots of people are, are gathering, there are going to be people there who are doing more negative things and that does need to be tackled as effectively as do possible. You, do you feel pressured to be on those hyper-local things, to be super agile and for a reporter to get a story out instantly so you hoover up? No, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously... An individual can immediately find out something or feel they found, found out something and then post it immediately on Facebook and they have no responsibilities to, you know, beyond the law and in terms of whether that's correct or not. Um, we have different responsibilities as, as journalists. We're a small organisation, but we are a professional news organisation, so we do want to get uh, stories out quickly, but we want to make sure they're properly fact-checked and accurate. But I, I don't. We haven't found that to be a major problem. I think people in our local areas do distinguish between what we do as a professional journalism organisation and what a person posting on on Facebook may do. That's not to say a person 
posting a rumor or posting something factually incorrect on on Facebook is not doing damage. You know, they are they are potentially doing damage, but I don't think they're necessarily damaging us as a news organisation. Thank you, Carl. I, I think ultimately it's about building trust with your audience. Um, our journalists live in the communities, they know the communities. I put 10 principles on our website about all our journalists have to follow. Um, when we first started and went into these Facebook groups, we were met with disdain, quite frankly, and we had to get them on side to say, look, we are there to champion this town, to promote causes, to promote the town, um, just like newspapers used to do 25 years ago. And that took time to build that trust, but every one of our journalists is told, you have to build trust, you have to follow those principles. And if you do that, ultimately that quality will come through, but it's all about being local, being within the community. Your own um, platforms for discussions, you've not uh, thought about that? Sorry? Having your own platform for discussions, you've not sort of thought to migrate? We, we have our own platforms. We don't have comments on our sites because we don't want that abuse. Um, if we have on our Facebook pages, we have comments. If anybody's rude uh, or abusive, they're instantly muted. Um, so we have to monitor that. That is an issue. Um, but it's not a huge issue and it's not a huge time constraint. Again, it's about building trust and it's about being local. The, the, the tree in the forest where no one's at falls, when no one's around, makes no noise. That's the idea, isn't it, when it comes to, to muting. Uh, Giles Watling. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, all three of you, for coming today. Uh, it's an interesting discussion. Um, a previous incarnation of this committee um, went to Washington and New York on a completely other uh, mission. Um, but during that mission, we met with uh, Mark Thompson, who was then the CEO of the New York Times, and he said something quite extraordinary. He said that in 20 years, he didn't envisage that there would be a print version of the New York Times in existence. And th this question um, really goes to David first, because I'm terribly impressed that you've launched the Waltham Forest Echo, the Haringey Community Press, Enfield Dispatch, the EC1 Echo, and the Barnet Post, all in the last 10 years or so. And you are going to be fast expanding into print. What do you think is the future? Yeah, I, I think it's a really, really interesting question. I mean, as, as I mentioned earlier, I and mean, when we were getting started as a small organisation with no significant investment capital. I mean, we went into print because we feel print has a value. We feel it has a, a social value uh, in terms of reaching parts of the community that wouldn't necessarily be going online and looking for local news in, in the same way as uh, you know, a reason of print publication. But we also went into print just based on our situation. It was it, it commercially made sense. And it still does, like, the, the residual advertising market in print is still quite significant. I mean, you'll all be aware it's, it's much, much smaller than, than it was, you know, 15 years ago. But, you know, it is, there is still a lot of money in, in print advertising. How long that will continue for, it's difficult to say. I mean, we're not noticing a massive drop in print advertising income currently. I mean, we came into that market when things were very bad. <laughs> They're not getting dramatically worse from that, that, that starting point. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to know. I, I, I think the challenge is that if you remove print from the equation, I mean, on the one hand, you've got the discussions about do people like print newspapers and do they have a wider social value, which is important. But purely on the commercial side, if you're actually going to do publications at a local level, um, in, in particular kinds of areas, I mean, the situation in larger UK cities is a little bit different, but the situation in, in different ways at London borough level or at the smaller town level is, is, is that you know, the, 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 there's a real problem because the residual print advertising market is still vitally important to those publications that exist. And there isn't really anything beyond that. There, there, there isn't any way in a, you know, in a small town you can do a local publication based on programmatic ad income. So, so either print is going to be part of the future for a very, very long time, or some other, you know, direct uh, reader revenue model is going to be the future but but it, you, you can't do that mass thing so you're in a situation where even if 100 percent of the people in in the area you're based in are clicking on the product that's not going to fund the journalists so, so from your point of view the, the print uh, print editions are stable at the moment you would say 
yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it remains it remains vitally important to our business model, but it, it remains important to our, our social model as well. You know, it's about getting to people who, who, as I say, wouldn't go online and read news, but also being a physical presence in the local community. The fact that people can, you know, be walking along the street, find one of our uh, newsstands, pick out a copy of the paper and read it, sure. and that's that's a you know, that makes you part of the community. And, and the, the, the demography of, of, of my particular constituency is fairly elderly. I'm one of them. And as John Nicholson says, we, we like to hold the uh, newspapers. It's, it's a wonderful thing to hold, So you, and you can offer... A widespread, but one of the problems I imagine is for I, I've been talking to one of my uh, local journalists who, who um, I've known for, for many years before this session today, and um, I've noticed his particular operation, the local gazette uh, for Clacton, Frinton, Walton, etc. Um, when I first knew him, there were there were people in the office, there were people doing this, that, and the other. Gradually, that has narrowed down until he's multitasking now. He's editing, he's putting... And, and I would imagine this, this gives him a, a, a challenge to produce quality copy that people would be interested in, in, in writing. And indeed, also uh, producing more sensational stuff to garner hits. Now, is this a, a, a typical example? Is it, how is it working in your operation, David? I'm sorry, everybody else, but for the moment, I'd like to ask Yeah, it, 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 it absolutely is a challenge. But, I mean, for us, having a local office is, is really important. So, so our, our three... Uh, you know, main borough newspapers in Waltham Forest, Haringey and uh, Enfield all have locally based offices within the local community, two of them within community centres and all of them have a couple of journalists who are based out of those those offices. We're looking to establish a local office in, in Barnet as, as soon as possible. So that's really important to us. It's really important to be physically in the local community, to, you know, to be there if people want to, to drop in and talk to us, to be able to go physically to local events to, to talk to people. But I mean, we're under no illusions. That is really difficult to continue to pay for. And, and it's yeah, the, there isn't there's not an obvious route back to a situation where a local newspaper in a London borough would have had five or six reporters based in their office. You know that that revenue just isn't there anymore. And for us, it's really really important. But this is going to be going to be sort of one of the key challenges to maintain that over the coming years. And you know, I, I definitely hope it's possible, but it's, it is difficult. Do you, uh, any comments from? You? Just say, as your point about the social need, uh, the newspaper is a lifeline for a lot of older people, um, so there's definitely a social need for that. I was talking with Neil, our national editor, about Nub News having a print run in a few years' time, maybe once a month. Um, we get print advertising revenue from it, but there is that definite need there. Whether it's sustainable or not, it will be a, it will be a nice to have rather than something which is part of our overall business model. It is print losing uh, advertising revenue to the internet. <coughs> yeah, but it's only once a month. It won't be that much. So okay, I'll, I'll tell them what. So, so what we're asking, we're asking individuals to be far more entrepreneurial. Uh, so we're asking a journalist instead of the traditional way to 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 uh, uh, look for um, being able to be a fundraiser, a salesperson, a business development manager, and all those other skills that you wouldn't normally expect a journalist to have. Um, is there training? Are there resources for people to, to access? I mean, that's perhaps not a scenario I recognise. We're, we're obviously an operation of scale comparatively, so, so we're not asking people to multitask. Um, in terms of print, the print product is you know, still incredibly important part of our operation. Um, it's, as I said before, I think it's far from a niche product. Um, I wouldn't want to, to put a time, but it remains profitable. Um, I spend, you know, a good part of my day talking about the front page of the Liverpool Echo because, you know, that is that is what people see. It's it's our brand in, in one page. So it's it remains a key part of the operation. Long, long may it continue and long may people still want to um, invest in it, I think. And titles like the Liverpool Echo have been around for years and people are very fond of it. I remember it well. I think I got a, got a good review in it once. But, um, uh, it's, it's, so, so you you have that sort of dedication, that rolling thing. But for new uh, pro pro products that David is coming out, you've got to create that uh, attraction, haven't you? And 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 how is that going, David? Well, it, it's, been, it's going really well. But I mean, it, that is that is where being embedded within the lo local community is a really important part of it. So I mean, in terms of how our, our business model started, we began with a a mixed uh, voluntary and paid model, so with with, uh, with 
paid journalists doing the news reporting, but features content being written on a voluntary basis by local people and people from community organisations to, to complement that. And as we've, we've grown our operations, yeah, there's still some of those voluntary contributions, but we have a, a bigger you know, paid team there, so we're able to do more of the, the professional journalism. But that, the community's direct involvement in creating the newspaper, I think, has helped, helped the local communities to feel ownership of it. The print element is important in local communities feel, feel, feeling ownership and that, that local office presence also once again is important. I, I, I think though it is you know, the kind of stories we cover also have an impact on that. So the fact that we are, you know, obviously we do report bad things when they happen, but in, in terms of the broad picture we are positive about our local communities and what's going on there, looking at how we can bring people together and amplify the voices of local communities, particularly those within communities whose, whose voices otherwise wouldn't be heard. I think those things you know, put together are, are important in, as, as Carl's mentioned, the building of trust with the local community, and that that is that is vitally important. I mean, it, it's important to how we're seen as a news organisation, but it, it's also partly important to the business model because some of the very locally focused advertisers will, will, will see, you know, by advertising in this community-based publication, we as a business can help to support you know, local news in our area and a, a local newspaper that's really committed to our area, so, so it has that, has that wide well, impact. Well, I wish you every luck with that. Just finally for me, it's a slightly different subject, um, is buyout from a multi-title group uh, an effective way to solve the business pressure, pressures uh, faced by local news organisations? Is what sorry? Buyout by a multi by a, a multi-title group. So if there's everybody's looking at each other. I I I <laughs> I, 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 I have an answer for that. I, mean, I have an answer on I suppose on the the broader question of consolidation, which I think is really really important, and obviously that that is a, a consequence of buyouts. Um, I think in in the area we cover. We, we have a, a current area of 1.2 million people in, in, uh, in North and East London. Uh, we, we have seven journalists across that area, which is, yes, you know, we'd like to have a lot more, but uh, the, our, our, corporate, our main corporate competitor has zero journalists in that area. They, they, they uh, edit those papers in North, East and Central London uh, from Watford. Uh, the editor of the Watford Observer chips in and, and covers the papers there and you know, uses the content from BBC Local Democracy Reporter, but they have no locally based journalists in that area. So you can't really consolidate that situation any more than that. It, it, it's kind of, in many local areas, it's reached its limits. You know, uh, HR, fundraising, I, marketing, I, etc. I, I, I think the difficulty is that in many areas, and as I say, it's not true in the larger cities, but in London boroughs and many of the small and smaller towns, the extent of managed decline in the corporate sector is so great, there's not really much further for them to go with that. That's, that's the issue. But I mean, the, 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 the other situation is, and we mentioned about the value people see in the brands and the affection they have for local publications. Some of the local publications, particularly in London boroughs, were so, so bad that, that in a sense, if you were... If you had the choice between starting from scratch in a London borough or being given the local corporate newspaper in that borough, you'd be better off starting from scratch because you know, the, the corporate paper has costs and responsibilities, but it doesn't really have any assets other than the public notice contracts that we've mentioned. Right. So, so you, you'd be better off yeah. starting from scratch than, than you would taking on a, a corporate publication in, in, in many areas where there's that level of, of managed decline. Can I answer the consolidation question as well? Um, I mean, this industry is dying. It's, di it's been dying for 10 years. I think, Clive, you asked the question in one of the previous sessions about whether the industry is drying. There's not much news in lo there's not much money in local news anymore. Or we've seen one of the biggest national organisations go bust. We've seen another one get what is equity wiped out. They, they are consolidating as much as they can. All that does is give them another year, another two years, another three years. It's dying. I think this question was being asked 10 years ago. It was being asked five years ago. 
Dame Frances Cairncross had her review into local journalism three years ago, and those questions were being asked then. And I, you know, I'll quote from her then. She talked about established companies have often found it hard to reinvent themselves and thus survive technolo technological change like Kodak and Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, we, we would need to see new institutions. We need to see new innovations in technology and business models. This is all what Dame Frances Cairncross said. Right now, what we're seeing with the government and public advertising campaigns and the public notices, the government are really propping up Blockbuster when they really should be looking for Netflix. Right, absolutely. Thank you, Jack. Can Thank I just say one word? It's not for me to say whether you know consolidation is the right thing for, for different organisations, but you make a valid point. I, I, you know, if I have a, a big legal question, I'm not making those decisions by myself. I've got a legal team. I've talked about our online safety officer. You're right about HR. Um, I'm just able to get on with doing my job, which is finding and serving and publishing the best possible content for, for, for our readers, and there is definitely advantages to that, I think. Okay, fine, thank you. Uh, Clive Efford. Uh, uh, just, just, just start before, my, my question's about funding, but, but I was just struck when John Nicholson was talking about newspapers, and uh, uh, is there a cr crossover between... Um, people who buy a newspaper on a regular basis and they buy their local newspaper as well. Is that, your lar is that a larger proportion of your market, is people who are in the habit of buying newspapers? Do you mean buying national newspapers? National well, newspapers you, Yeah, no, absolutely, it. yeah. I mean, I, can, I see data from across, across all the, the spectrum, and um, yes, people do buy their local and buy their is national. That your main of, is, is that where the market is, for people who are in the habit of buying a, a you know, physical newspaper will also buy their local newspapers, they're more inclined to do so? No, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think necessarily that. We, we've certainly experimented with, with sort of offers around that sort of, that sort of habit. But no, I think, I think generally people are loyal to their local newspaper. And we did a lot of work during the pandemic in increasing our sort of home delivery service, et cetera, so encouraging loyalty through, through subscription. But no, it's not my understanding that that's the, that's the principal buyer. I think, I think people are, you know, we do have an established brand. We are very local to our community, and, and, and there is that habit. And, you know, our challenge comes with, with seeing that continue. And that used to be something that passed down through generations, and, and sort of keeping that brand awareness is important. And it. is there a, a, a sort of generational thing? Um, you know that uh, our younger people getting it in the, in the habit of buying a local newspaper, or are they getting their news from you on the on their mobile phones? They're getting their news from us on their mobile phones, and they might not even know it's from us. So I think there is, you know, we do have a brand um, issue to to work on, and that's why we have been working with with platforms used by a younger generation, but. That there is still the appetite. I'm absolutely convinced there is still the appetite, but not yeah. necessarily the loyalty. Yeah, OK. Well, I'd better get on to my questions that, I, that I'm supposed to be asking, otherwise the chair will be uh, telling me off. So um, uh, th there are various uh, areas of funding around <coughs> Leicester, Future News Pilot, BBC's Local Democracy Report and Service, uh, and Meta's got Community News Project, Google's got the, uh, the News Initiative. Uh, I mean, what, what's wrong with the funding for uh, um, local news? Is there any, is, is this a good way of uh, funding local news? Is there, is there a better way of doing it? I'll come to all three of you. Shall I, shall I start? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, I think there's two problems. I mean, one, I'm sure you'd expect us to say this, but is there's not very much of it in in, in terms of in terms of the the volume of, of funding available. And Does it go to the right people? Well, I I, I, I think like in, in terms of you know, we are a, a not for profit social enterprise local news publication, and in terms of that independent not for profit local news sector, I mean there, there's more in, in in the US there's more money going into local news in the city of Chicago. Than there is in the entirety of the UK in terms of uh, the, the philanthropic funding that's, that's going to local news. So there's, there's really very, there's very very small amounts of, of money. I mean, you, you mentioned the the Nest uh, Future News Fund, which I, I uh, worked on to to an extent, and you know that was a that was a, a, a that was a pot of two million pounds. About a million of it was actually grant funding, and in terms of actual operational local news organisations, two organisations got grants of tens of thousands of pounds uh, out of the 140 uh, members of the independent community news network. So, so, so it, you know, these, these schemes are, 
so far in terms of volume not really scratching the surface. But, but I, think, I think the more important, well, that's a very important question, but, but, but alongside that is the question of what is actually being funded or subsidised if we are going to have funding or, or subsidy. And I think, I mean, I'm from the not-for-profit sector, but I don't think all funding should go to not-for-profits necessarily, but I think it needs to go to actually supporting journalism and news and to go to organisations that have news at the, part of the, at the heart of their business model rather than organisations, you know, declining organisations in the digital marketing space who do a little bit of news alongside that. It's really how can we actually support news and how can we fund journalism, that is really, really important. But part of that for the new entrants is how do you support business development, how do you support organisations who are coming up, uh, you know, who may be one person living in a local area operating at their, ki their kitchen table who's a former journalist, how do you provide them with some funding so that they can develop a business model for their activity, that they can sell advertising, that they can generate the range of income streams they need? And funding channeled into that is, is vitally important. That kind of funding has not yet been available uh, at uh, all in the UK. Before it comes to the others, just, just can you add, is it long term enough, the funding that's available, to, to, to support that sort of um, start up? Uh, well, th th there, isn't, there isn't any ongoing funding available. Th there's a number of schemes which support particular reporting. Should there be? I, 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 think, I think we definitely do need that. Certainly at, at, the, at the state the market's in and that, the kind of uh, the gaps that are emerging, if that kind of funding is not made available, then it won't be possible for the transition from the old model of, of local journalism to a, to a new sustainable one that investment in business development is vitally important. Because currently we, we, have, we have funding of news posts, local democracy reporter scheme funds posts, we have two of them, it's great. The Facebook um, NCTJ Community News Project also funds journalism posts, and that, that, that's very valuable, but if there's not support to enable the organisations to develop effectively as businesses alongside that, that in itself is, is not going to... Uh, entirely enable those uh, gaps uh, to be plugged. Before I ask the others to come in, j j just one other question to, to, to you, and then they can answer all of it together, which is um, um, about government funding. Should there be more government funding? I, I, think the, I think, as mentioned earlier, government could do a lot to, in terms of reforming the public notice system so that, that is actually channeled to, you know, supporting journalism effectively, but also maybe actually helping people to find out about the public notices as well. That might be a useful thing, rather than the current model we have there, because that is, you know, that's tens of millions of pounds that is currently being very ineffectively directed based on the current model. So government could do something about that. I think in terms of government's own advertising campaigns, it could, could do something about that. I, I think in terms of the wider funding landscape, maybe the role of government is, is crowding in other sources of funding. Potentially, I, mean, I, I, yeah, I personally don't think we want to see government bankrolling local news. I think that there's there's you know, there's dangers attached to that as, as well as positives. But I think government can play a really important catalytic role in that, and that, I think that that's what's needed. Yeah, thank you, Carl. Um, funding is not the answer. The business model is broken. Something drastic has to happen. Um, and at the moment, I'm not asking the money, the government for money. I'm asking for a level playing field. So if they are going to give out money in terms of funding, in terms of public advertising, in terms of public noticing, let that money be evenly spread. I'm not here to talk to the government and say, give me more money. I've just raised millions of pounds from in private investors to form a business. And then I look over here and tens and tens and tens of millions are propping up an old business model, which does not work. So the funding for me is just a short term solution and elongates the problem more than anything else and acts as a huge barrier to entry to independent networks like Love News, like David's business as well. Uh, and that's the real issue. So the answer is no, I don't like funding. That said, I do like the BBC Local Democracy Service. I know this came from John Whittingdale on one of these inquiries as well. That is a true level playing field for me because I get access to that, or Love News gets access to that copy. So do you, and so do others. So that level playing field is really all I'm asking for. If there is funding to be had, make sure it's given out equally. So, but I don't think it's the answer. Mm. Uh, just on that bit of that, the, give, the money being given out equally, 
Um, are, you, are you saying that large corporations tend to hoover it up at the expense of startups and smaller organisations? I don't know the stats, but I would say 95% of it goes to the top four players. Right. I'd okay. have to check those facts. Okay. But yeah, thank you. Mary? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, a title like Liverpool Echo is not looking for charity at all, just a little bit of help in, in terms of levelling up the playing fields with, with pa pa platforms. Um, I think it's widely agreed that the BBC LDR scheme has been beneficial to, to very many parties. We, we entered into it in the spirit it was intended, and we've really tried to, to go beyond our remit, so we support our LDRs. We, our political editor will manage them, they develop, they're given training and we, we work with them to produce really good content that is accessible to other organisations that are part of the scheme. Um, so so that's, that's generally been positive. Um, in, terms of, in terms of government, I think, you know, obviously the, the advertising during the pandemic was incredibly helpful and I would like to think a title like the Liverpool Echo would deliver good value for money in terms of the people it reached and, and I would say the same with, with public notices but I appreciate that is a, is a thorny issue. The, the answer is you're going to provide local news for the communities, have businesses proud of that local news and have those businesses sponsor those sites and be proud to be you know, helping local businesses. And crew, we have Radius Payment Solutions that help us. They're our biggest sponsor. The co-op is ahead of the game.